And here we go with my talk. I hope you really enjoy this. It's called Writing Fiction Set in Old Riot. And that picture that we see with what looks like uh, gardeners and domestic staff is a picture of Riot Hall, a very grand building that was in Riot Village, but sadly no longer exists. And it's places like Riot Hall and the history of Riot and the heritage of the place that I try to bring to life in my novels. Before I begin to take you on a walk down memory lane with some smashing old pictures of Riot, I wanted to show you my book covers. The books are standalone books, they're not a series, so they can be read in any order. They're all set at the end of the First World War, which was a time of great change for society in general and for women in particular. The focus in my books is on young women and how they deal with the many situations I throw at them, and I throw everything and the kitchen sink at these poor girls. These are the six books published so far, and I'll be talking very briefly about each one. And there are going to be another two coming so far. We had three publishers fighting over my debut novel, which was Bell of the Backstreets, and I chose Publisher Headline. The books are available everywhere online that you would normally buy your favourite books, and they're from available in bookstores also. For over 100 years, Ryup was a coal mining village. The Ryup Coal Company sank the mine in 1867, and this picture here shows it in 1900, and the pit closed down almost 100 years later in the 1960s. At its height, in the 1930s, there were over 2,000 men and boys employed. Before the mine was sunk, Ryup was a farming village, but once the mine was sunk, the village became a village of two halves. There were, you had the farming community and the mining community. And it's these two halves of the village I write about in my books. There are dangers in the occupations of mining and farming. And I talk about what the lives were like for the, the women who supported the men who worked at the mine, especially. This lovely picture shows the more pastoral side to Ryup life in contrast to the muck and the dirt and the industry of the coal mine that we've just seen. This picture shows the original Albion Inn on Ryup Village Green and it's the pub which takes a starring role in my debut novel Bell of the Back Streets. Here we can see a horse and cart outside of the pub and the road curves away ahead to Grangetown and to Sunderland. Just a word on pubs in Ryup at this time. As any visitor to Ryup knows, even now, there are a lot of pubs for such a small village. At the time I write about, there were 16 pubs and clubs running from the Colliery Inn at the top of the bank to the railway inn in the village. So that's just over one mile, 16 pubs. Well, farming and mining were very thirsty work and the pubs played a very important role in servicing the needs of this working community. But what about the houses? Where did the miners and farmers live? Well, in ramshackle cottages such as these, which look decrepit to our eyes now. These are exactly the sort of houses I write about in all of my novels. These are the back streets in my book, Bell of the Back Streets. And these are the pit lanes in my book, Pearl of Pit Lane. There was no electricity, of course, and no running water. There were shed taps in the back of the pit lanes where women used to get water for cooking and cleaning, bathing and washing. And as for toilets, or netties as we call them, these were shared too and in the back lanes. On washing days, clean laundry was strung across the back lanes and war betide anyone who tried to walk down the back lane when washing was hanging out. In my novel, The Miner's Lass, there's a wonderful scene where the local delivery boy takes his horse and cart down the back lane when the washing's hanging out all the way down. When the women catch him muddying up their washing, they chase him and threaten his manhood. Now this lovely old building was the Ryup Co-op, or to give it its full name, the Ryup and Silksworth Industrial and Providential Society Limited Central Premises. It was a grand store, the lifeblood of many pit villages. Sadly, this building has long gone in Ryup, although there are still some co-ops that do exist, such as the one in Berkeley, County Durham. Although the building has been transformed into a different use, it's no longer a co-op store. There is a preserved cooperative store at Beamish Museum, which was moved faithfully brick by brick from Anfield Plain. And speaking of Beamish Museum and moving buildings brick by brick, I'm very proud to say that Ryup's very old Grand Electric Cinema has been moved to Beamish, where it's going to form the centrepiece of Beamish's 1950s village. The Grand Electric Cinema features in all of my books too. 
It's a place for courting couples to whisper sweet nothings in the dark and for some rather dramatic scenes to be played out too. When I'm researching my books, I use as many original items as I can, as possibly can to transport me back in time. So this picture shows a tiny snippet from the 1920 Ordnance Survey map of Ryib, which I was given a photocopy of at Durham County Records Office. I love working from old maps and plans, from documents and photographs, as they give me a real feel for the time and a great sense of place. Here on the old Ryib map, we see the miners' hall marked as well as the letters PH for public house. Also marked on the map are the pit lanes of Single Burden Street, North Tunsil Street and Double Ryup Street, all long gone. Note how closely the houses are packed together in long rows that stretched all the way down the colliery bank. These houses were demolished in the 1930s and there's nothing left of them now. The passing place for trams that I've written onto the map is where the road widens to enable trams to pass on the colliery bank. The same spot is now used as a bus stop, a reminder of the past. I'd like to take a moment here to credit Ron Lawson's book, A Historic Look at the Pubs of Ryup and Silksrip, as I've used it extensively in my research of Ryup's many pubs. It's a great resource and if you'd like to know more, the book is available to buy from Sunderland Antiquarian Society and you can find them online. I remember the first time I ever went into Sunderland Antiquarian Society when I was researching my debut novel, Bell of the Backstreets. I was slightly nervous. Well, the Antiquarian Society sounds like an officious bunch of keepers of the city's history, and indeed they are, but I needn't have worried, for they couldn't have been more helpful and friendly, and I'm proud to call myself a member of the society now. I'm now going to tell you a little bit about each of the books that have been published so far. I won't go too much into plot and I certainly won't give away any spoilers. So the first book that we had three publishers fighting over was Belle of the Backstreets. And this wonderful picture shows a view of Ryup Street looking up the colliery bank. Um, if you know Ryup, just imagine you've got the community centre on your right hand side. So this lovely old picture. Um, we can see a chapel in the distance on the right and what appears to be a horse in the middle of the road too. The horse is important in this context because Belle of the Backstreets is about a young girl who takes on her dad's rag and bone round and she has a horse to pull her cart and a dog to protect her too. Each of my books is set in or around one of Ryup's many pubs and in Belle of the Backstreets the pub is the Albion Inn that we saw earlier. So here's the old picture of the Albion Inn, which I showed you earlier, and here's what the pub looks like now. The Albion Inn is also where I held the book launch for this particular book, and it's a night that I will never forget. Such a success. Bell of the Back Streets also features second-hand goods traders, tinkers, rag and bone men, and market traders in Sunderland. I researched a lot about markets, especially in the east end of Sunderland, and I love this old picture. I used this as inspiration for the market in Bell of the Back Streets, where the heroine of the story, Meg Sutcliffe, learns her trade. The second book is The Tuppenny Child, and it's centred around the Railway Inn, which is just off the village green in Ryup. The uh, Railway Inn would be the first building that any traveller to Ryup would have seen when they alighted from the train station in Ryup. And it's the first building that my heroine, Sadie Linthorpe, sees when she travels to Ryup alone. She's penniless and heartbroken, and she arrives in Ryup. She doesn't know anyone. She's a true outsider, and everyone treats her with suspicion. When they find out why she's arrived in Ryup, they're shocked. But I don't want to spoil the plot for you. Suffice to say, Sadie is my favourite heroine of them all so far. She's the first woman to wear trousers in the village, the first to ride a bike, and she also sets up her own business, baking and selling pies and bread. This picture shows Carlisle Marketplace in 1904, where a young girl is accepting a shilling, which contracts her into domestic service. It was common for girls from areas like County Durham to find work away from home. And I use this picture as inspiration for the Tuppany Child, where Sadie Linthorpe is originally from Hartlepool, but she takes a job in Ryup. I'm being very careful about what I say because I don't want to give the plot away. But this picture was pivotal in inspiring a lot of the story. The Tuppany Child also covers baking, cooking and the whole domestic arrangements of life. 
and as part of my research, I used one of the original B-roll books pictured here, the heroine of the Tuppany child, Sadie, as well as baking her own pies and bread to sell, is taking on at the very grand Ryup Hall to work as a maid, and so learning about the meals cooked in the 1920s was vital research for the story. The Tuppany Child also has a wonderful Irish women's Christmas in it, and if you're wondering what an Irish women's Christmas is, well, I'd never heard of it either before I started writing the book. It was a friend in Dublin who told me all about it, and it's a celebration for Irish women to come together on January the 6th each year, and it's a celebration for women only to celebrate Christmas after the big Christmas of December the 25th. So the Irish Women's Christmas is sometimes called the Little Christmas or the Women's Christmas. And here we can see that the Irish Women's Christmas is still celebrated even now. This is just one example of, of an advertisement used to sell the event to women each January the 6th. Um, so the more women know about it, the better. I think it's a great tradition and one we should perhaps celebrate here in England too. My third book is Pearl of Pit Lane. And this one's a little different, a little darker, in that it's about a young girl called Pearl who lives with her Aunt Annie, who works as a prostitute. Pearl sees that the life of a prostitute comes with all kinds of problems, and the way Annie's treated in the village isn't what Pearl wants for her own life. Pearl decides that being a prostitute is not what she wants to do, although it is expected of her. And so Pearl runs away, leaving Annie behind in the colliery, while Pearl lives in the farming part of the village. And again, we're emphasising the village of two halves. As part of the research for Pearl of Pit Lane, I talked to Reverend Chadwick, the vic vicar at St Paul's Church in Ryup. Indeed, I talked to him each time I researched my books. And this time, I needed to know where in the church a young girl would hide after she ran away from home. The vicar showed me all the hiding places in the church, and I was fortunate to be shown up to the bell tower, an experience I'll never forget, and one I include in the book when Pearl hides in the bell tower. I was able to use all of the smells, sounds and sights from my trip up the narrow stone dusty staircase and write them into the book. So as Pearl of Pit Lane is about women who work as prostitutes, I am indebted to another book from Sunderland Antiquarian Society. This amazing book is called The Dressmakers of Fighting Cock Lane. The women referred to as dressmakers weren't dressmakers though, although Fighting Cock Lane did exist in the east end of Sunderland. The women who worked as prostitutes called themselves dressmakers when they had to write their profession on a form. They could hardly admit their true profession or they would have been arrested, and so they said they were dressmakers instead. The census reports of Sunderland at the time show a large number of women employed as dressmakers in the east end of Sunderland. The book is a wonderful read. It'll make your hair curl, and it's available from the Sunderland Antiquarian Society, written by Norman Kirtland and Sharon Vincent. So back to poor Pearl of Pearl of Pit Lane, who's run away from her Aunt Annie. Who Annie's living on the colliery bank and Pearl is living in the village, which is the more pastoral side to Rye of Life. I did a great deal of research into shops of the time because that's where Pearl ends up working in a small grocery shop. This lovely old picture shows the Oriental Bar in Rye, which makes an appearance in the book. My fourth book is The Girl with the Scarlet Ribbon. And for this story, we sail between Rye and Scarborough on the Yorkshire coast. Scarborough is one of my favourite places, and it was a joy to research there and write about it in the book. The book features a shipwreck on Rye Beach, and I'm indebted to Sunderland Maritime Heritage Centre for their help. Here we have a wonderful old advertisement and an illustration of the screw steamer called the General Havelock which sailed between Sunderland and London and during the summer months called it Scarborough. So how could I not write this into the book? It was just, it's too good to be true. Um, this picture and this advert inspired um, a shipwreck that happens in the story. It's, a, it's purely fictional and uh, I use a different name for the boat, but this is where the inspiration came from. Also in The Girl with the Scarlet Ribbon is a Ryup Street called St Paul's Terrace, where a large part of the action is set in a boarding house for destitute girls. This is a purely fictional house I created at the end of St Paul's Terrace, and it's run by a lady I created called Miss Gilby, who dresses in black, and she's a very formidable woman. 
The Girl with the Scarlet Ribbon also features a wonderful old building in Ryeth that's called the Wilderness, but in my book I fictionalised it and called it the Uplands. Here you can see the wilderness as it was over 100 years ago and now how it is now. Little has changed when you look at it from a certain angle. I did lead a walking tour around Ryeth showing all of the locations I use in my books as part of Heritage Open Days. This was before lockdown and the pandemic, but I'd love to do it again once things get back to normal. So please follow me on social media and online. And if I do run another walking tour of Ryeth, I'll be sure to let you know. The Paper Mill Girl is my fifth book and it's set in Ryeth and Hendon this time. It's set in a fictional version of Hendon Paper Mill in Grangetown and is about a girl called Ruth Hardy who works at the paper mill. She comes up against many dangers there, dangers in the mach machinery and in the work that she does. But the real danger comes from someone she's forced to work with, someone who threatens her and the girls at the mill. I did a lot of research into paper mills and particularly in the work that the women used to do. Here's a lovely old shot of Hendon Paper Mill in Sunderland showing the two prominent chimneys. The sight of the chimneys was so distinctive that in World War II the Germans used the paper mill as a navigation aid in their bombing raids on the northeast coast. Sadly Hendon Paper Mill no longer exists and so to research old paper mills I visited Frogmore Mill in Apsley, Hertfordshire, which has a visitor centre and even a paper making machine which is over 100 years old. I got to see how paper was made back then and even made my own sheet of handmade paper. Frogmore Mill is a wonderful place, very friendly and I highly recommend you visit if you can if you're ever in the area. Here's a wonderful picture of some of the female workers at Hendon Paper Mill. The girls here look very clean and tidy, very neat, and indeed working at the mill was a lot less difficult and dirty than some of the professions the girls went into. The cleanliness and the quality of the ladies' toilets, of all things, at the mill were even commented on in one report of the time. This suggests, perhaps, an employer who looked after the welfare of their workers, and it's certainly something that I put into the Paper Mill Girl book. And again, more female workers at Hendon Paper Mill. The work that women did at the paper mill in 1919 included sweeping the floor free of shavings of paper. And in the Paper Mill Girl book, the girls are employed in the rag room or the cutting room, taking buttons, collars and cuffs off the clothes brought in as raw materials to make paper. It was dangerous work because they were using knives. Women were also employed in the counting room, where their nimble fingers were highly prized for counting sheets of paper quickly. My sixth book, which has just come out in hardback and it comes out in paperback in October, is The Miner's Lass. And this book is set firmly around the uh, coal mine and riot coal company. The heroine of the book is Ruby, who is the miner's daughter, and she falls for a man who's a miner too. But just when it looks like Ruby's life is set when she agrees to marry her minor boyfriend, something so shocking happens and it means that life will never be the same again for any of the characters in the book. The building on the right is Cherry Knoll Hospital in Sunderland. It's long gone now, demolished, but in its day it was the Sunderland Borough Lunatic Asylum and it features heavily in The Miner's Lass, where I tackle themes of mental health. Also in this book are themes of domestic life and of how hard life was for the families of miners, with the coal fire constantly burning to warm water for baths for the miners when they came home from the pit. But it's not all doom and gloom in this book, and there's a very funny, quite saucy scene involving a miner having his bath. And that's all I want to say, as I don't want to spoil the plot. So that's all of my books so far to date. Um, I also write a weekly soap opera called Riverside for the People's Friend magazine. So it, it, it's a contemporary soap opera. It, you know, it, it's funny, it's frothy, and it's in the magazine every single week. It's been running since 2016. So you can also, as well as my books, you can also find me in the People's Friend each week. And so now there's only one thing left to say, and that's thank you very much indeed for joining me on this nostalgic look at Ryeb and how it inspires my novels. Please visit my website at glendayoungbooks.com and come and say hello. Thank you. Bye bye.